So thank you very much for attending this conflict briefing on prospects for lasting peace in Colombia. My name is Antonio Sampaio. I am the research fellow for conflict, security and development at the IISS here in London. Um, Colombia has faced a turbulent time since the signing of the peace agreement in 2016 with what was then one of the largest and longest running insurgent groups in the Western hemisphere, the FARC. Whereas great progress has been made in demobilizing thousands of fighters, um, other armed actors have come into the picture and expanded the reach. The number of former FARC members murdered since the signing of the agreement is fast approaching the 200 mark. So these are some of the issues that we will explore today. And I haven't even mentioned the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on security and peace building efforts. So for all those issues and the discussion on the conflict, I am pleased to be joined by two speakers directly from Bogota. Maria Victoria Llorente is the executive director of Fundación Ideas para la Paz. And Oscar Palma is a professor of international relations and former director of the Observatory on Drugs and Crime at the Universidad del Rosario, also in Bogota. So I will give the word first to Maria Victoria and then to Oscar, and after that we will have a discussion. You can submit questions by clicking on the bottom of the screen um, on Q&A, and you submit your question um, via writing, uh, or you can raise your hand. Uh, it's on the bottom right of the screen, and I will then, I will try to do a round of questions in which I will give you, the attendee, um, a voice, and you will um, speak um, and um, ask your question. So, Maria Victoria, uh, thank you so much, and please. Um, okay, so good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I would like to thank IISS for putting together this webinar and inviting me to take part of it. Um, thank you, Antonio. It is great to have this conversation with you and, uh, and with Oscar. I'm very happy to see you all. So I would like to begin with an overview on the current situation of peace and, uh, and security in Colombia. And I would like to share four uh, headings. So my first heading, is that the armed confrontation is still active and there are no signs of a changing trend in the, near, in the near future. This is comparing data of the first four months of 2020 with previous years. So we have a variety of illegal armed groups, including guerrillas and a wide range of criminal gangs. And within this, this context, ELN, and FARC dissidences, dissidences are the most, uh, the most acti uh, active. As, the, uh, as for the activity of, uh, of uh, security forces, um, our data shows that in the same period, an increase in fights were reinforced uh, uh, and, uh, and the presence uh, uh, of, uh, of the security forces was reinforced in most critical uh, areas. Well, the good news is that there is an important reduction uh, on levels of lethality. Compared to last year, during the first four months of 2020, homicides have dropped uh, uh, like 16% uh, nationally and 12% in the most uh, uh, critical zones. This is an important achievement uh, with respect to uh, previous years. But the bad news is that there has been a dramatic surge in attack against social leaders, notably a 50% increase in homicides uh, during these uh, first uh, four months. And, uh, and also an increase, uh, there has been an increase in forced displacement. Uh, and, there are, and, and we have seen important environmental affectations uh, due to illegal mining, deforestation and attacks uh, to oil uh, pipelines. So as for the geographic fe features of the confrontation, the confrontation focalizes in few critical areas uh, uh, in Colombia. A strategic corridor that runs from the border with Venezuela at the northeast uh, to the Urabá Gulf uh, in the border with Panama, the Pacific uh, coast 
right to the border with uh, Ecuador on the southwest and on the southeast uh, in the part of the Amazon region. So it is very concentrated uh, in, in those areas. So now what happened during the, the pandemic, mainly March and April 2020? Overall, we saw a considerable drop in activity by worrying factions. As expected, these groups had differentiated reactions. Uh, some commanded restrictions to prevent contagion and others increased their attacks against social leaders and communities. So we register a significant decrease of homicides in these uh, two months, homicide rates in some regions. And partly uh, these uh, reductions were related to a unilateral ceasefire declared by, declared by ELN during April, which we're going, which I will refer um, in a moment. Unfortunately, these trends, um, this trend was not visible in the killings of uh, social leaders and FARC ex-combatants. Uh, uh, already uh, at least a hundred social leaders have been killed uh, uh, during, uh, during this, uh, this year and uh, a, a number, an important number of FARC ex-combatants. And there are also increases in forced displacement and lined uh, mine victims. So now I go to my second headline. There were no conditions for the ELN unilateral ceasefire to have sticking power. As already mentioned, ELN declared a unilateral ceasefire in April. And yes, it saved lives and it meant significant humanitarian relief for communities of areas under the influence of this guerrilla. But it did not lead to a bilateral ceasefire as the ELN demanded, nor to the reopening of negotiations with the ENN in Havana, as many pro-peace organizations wish for. Both the government and the ELN stuck um, to their preconditions, and on the 1st of May, the unilateral ceasefire was over. Uh, at the same time, the government was preparing a different strategy that sought to encourage the submission uh, of individual members uh, of, uh, of these illegal armed groups, included ELN, uh, to justice. Uh, and last but not least is the Venezuela issue. Uh, and uh, as we all know, uh, uh, anything that happens with ELN is connected with the Venezuela, with the Venezuela uh, crisis in the sense that an important part of the leadership of ELN is right now in Venezuela and a, an important a, a source of income of ELN comes from the, a, from the mining areas in a, Venezuela. A, so yes, a, the, Venezuela pro, a, the Venezuela crisis is quite connected with, the, with this and we all know that a, the Colombian a, government and a, the Maduro regime are right now have no cooperation at all and are right now uh, in a freeze uh, moment. So here comes my third headline. The implementation of the peace agreement with FARC slows down and fissures between the parties deepen. So the implementation of the peace agreement has faced numerous difficulties since its signing in November uh, 2016 starting with the structural weakness of the Colombian state that prevented, that prevented the, the execution of an immediate uh, response plan uh, to stabilize regions and protect the population and guarantee uh, the rights in the areas left uh, by FARC. Uh, then of course, there is the budget limitations uh, to advance in a long-term transformation agenda of the areas most affected by the conflict, the vast majority of which are rural and marginal, and uh, a whole point of the peace agreement had to do precisely with the integral reform of, uh, of uh, rural areas in Colombia. Um, and, and all this in a context of a major political divide with the peace agreement at the center of the polarization. So the Duque uh, government came to power two years ago on behalf of the parties that opposed the peace agreement. While he actively 
oppose the transitional justice system stated by the agreement, he prioritized, he nonetheless prioritized three aspects, aspects in his peace with legality policies. These were reintrogation of uh, ex-combatants, mainly focused on low-ranking ex-combatants, a dilicit crop substitution program, and the participatory development plans aim at transforming the regions more marginalized and affected uh, by conflict. So overall, we have had a little progress in economic uh, re reintegration. Uh, the numbers are, are really a, a complicated there. And also vulnerable conditions uh, of this uh, population are exacerbated by threats and, and killings of uh, ex-combatants. Um, on, the, on the side of the illicit crop uh, uh, substitution program, from the start, uh, this program has been lagging on the payments and technical assistance to families that voluntarily joined the program. On top of this, social leaders that have been part of the program have been targeted and many of them killed. Um, so, and on the other hand, as part of the measures to reduce coca, the government is uh, actively promoting forced eradic eradication, including the return to uh, aerial spreading, which has been, in, uh, which increases uncertainty among the coca growers and, of course, clashes with security forces. So the government has been concentrating most of, of its efforts into the regional transformation agenda but it has taken a long time to design the roadmap to, to carry out uh, this transformation. And in this, uh, in this agenda, COVID-19 is posing huge challenges in both logistic and operational uh, uh, terms. There will probably be a decrease in the budget and rearrangement of priorities. In the early days of the quarantine, the government announced the progr that programs for rural roads, water and er electrifications will be affected and will have delays. The implementation of the regional pro uh, programs also uh, are suffering delays because of the difficulties uh, of the in-person in participation uh, of local actors due to the quarantine. And in the past few weeks, there have been increasing complaints uh, from the part party leaderships and non and, and pro agreement organization to the UN for non compliance by the government, especially in what has to do with protecting social leaders and ex combatant. And finally, to close this uh, point, last week, FARC withdrew from uh, the bilateral verification uh, commission stated by the agreement, protesting the government's backing of the U.S., including Cuba, in the list of, cro of uh, countries that do not contribute in anti-terrorist uh, efforts. And now I will end up with my, four, my fourth uh, uh, heading. The time has come to talk about security sector reform. So the peace deal with FARC is unique in many respects. One of them is that it did not address the issue of security sector reforms for reasons that we could discuss uh, later. So we have been facing for the past few years a situation both in the police and in the, and in the military, which has now been revealed in various scandals showing substantive irregularities that encompasses abuse of intelligence power, lack of transparency in the handling of, uh, of resources, cover-ups and involvement in illegal activities and with criminal organizations. Now, this is not just a problem of corrupt military and police, of bad apples at it, at it, as it has been put. It is a political issue and one of weaknesses in the civilian uh, leadership to carry out uh, the reform needed to adapt the sector to the requirements of uh, stabilization uh, and peace building. So these four, these four uh, headings shows, as uh, many uh, uh, analysts uh, uh, forecast, that uh, uh, the pandemic at the end of the day will sur make surface the fragilities of uh, peace building in many of uh, the areas of the globe and particularly in Colombia. 
te much, Maria Victoria. Um, I, my connection fell during the <laughs> during part of your speech, but I'm happy to see that the webinar continued uh, unaffected. Uh, <laughs> these are the wonders of our um, technology. <laughs> so, okay. Oscar, you have the word now. Well, thank you. Thank you, Antonio, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I would love to be in London in a different context uh, at the Arundel House, fantastic house where IISS is it? Um, I miss it. It's uh, it, I miss it from my PhD years. I had wonderful time there. Uh, so it's it's good to at least online be with you, uh, thinking about these topics and about these issues. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's great uh, to to share this space with Maria Victoria as well. Um, so it's it's a massive pleasure. And and to all our guests, I can see several people in the list from our university at Rosario. So hello to everyone there, and to all of our guests, all of many guests that have joined in this. Uh, good morning as well to all of you. Um, I just want to uh, share one slide uh, because I basically just want to explain one simple idea uh, in this 10 minutes that we actually have uh, now. And I'm going to be a bit more academic uh, and uh, I'm going to present just a single idea of why or a contribution to the analysis of why conflict continues in Colombia. Uh, why do we still have armed actors out there doing what they do? Uh, and it's pretty much this idea that you see there. I assume that you're seeing this graph, but the idea is, is yes. you, fantastic. The idea is, is to sell this idea, to, to, <clears throat> to understand that what we have in Colombia is basically a complex system uh, with different actors that constantly adapts, fluctuates, changes according to the circumstances of the context. Uh, we can target groups, we can target people, commanders, uh, drug dealers, etc. But the system will adapt, will continue to evolve in order to continue existing. So, uh, we, we, we tend to think about uh, armed groups in Colombia in terms of specific groups, uh, FARC, ELN, Uravenos, and we should target this and we should target that. But the truth is that we have a system. We yeah. are facing a system. A, and this system is composed by networks, networks of people who constantly adapt, who change, who interact with others in order to preserve the, the system that exploits illicit economies and um, you know perpetuates all this violence that we see in the conflict. So what do we see here? We see different kind of actors. Uh, you can see right. Oh, by the way, it's, it's don't don't think that I have a specific data uh, like data that I used to create this graph. It's just a, a, an illustrative kind of idea. It's, it doesn't mean that the big dots mean something. And no, it's just an illustrative kind of idea. So we see right there in the center, Grupos Armados Organizados, GAOs, uh, which the government recognizes as um, the, the strongest ones in terms of manpower, in, ter in terms of firepower, uh, in terms of territorial domination and the capacity that they have to um, perform even governance duties in some of the uh, peripheral areas or regions in, in Colombia. Um, and these, for example, include Urabeños, include Puntilleros, um, you know, the, the, the most famous names, many of them involved in drug dealing and narco trafficking. Um, and then you can see examples of these GAOs, which include FARC's dissidents, according to the government's uh, categorization, FARC's uh, dissidences are a, an example of a grupos armados organizados, but we have a separate. Some some people separate it in order to you know make recognize it, uh, and and we call them gaoros, grupos armados organizados residuales, which is basically just for dissidents, and we can talk about them as well a bit ahead. But the ELN, the National Liberation Army, which uh, Maria Victoria was actually discussing, is also another uh, gao uh, because of the size of the power, the manpower, the, the fire, firepower capacity. Um, so these are different groups in this kind of system. 
but the system is not limited to this kind of groups. We also have uh, Grupos Delinquenciales Organizados, GDOs, which would also be armed groups, but with smaller firepower, without a sufficient capacity, let's say, to, to challenge the state on a national level in terms of security, but it can impose uh, dynamics, control dynamics in specific regions. So they can handle the population, they can uh, control the illicit economy. Uh, so it's, it's a different category. It's also armed actors within the system, uh, but ha they have a smaller firepower comp compared to the big grupos armados organizados. But then the system doesn't stop there. We've got down there outsourcing companies. Some people call it service companies, compañías de servicios, uh, oficinas de cobro, uh, different kind of names. But outsourcing companies, as, as the name says, uh, are, are companies which, are, which provide a series of services to the big groups. Uh, pretty much like in the private sector, you will find that companies do outsource several of their functions because they want to concentrate in, in some specific tasks and they, they just outsource whatever they want to do. So, for example, uh, charging the taxes, uh, extortions, uh, murdering. Sometimes they just outsource this kind of situation. So we have these specific offices, these other organizations with smaller capacity in terms of manpower, in terms of territorial control. They do not necessarily have a territorial control. They just provide services to the other bigger groups in the networks. But they do are, they are part of the uh, drug dealing whole system. So that's a different one. Now, you can, you can see other examples down there in the graph that you will see urban gangs and traffickers. Uh, if you think about a city like Medellin, you will find, yes, the big um, groups, et cetera, and then the outsourcing companies, like for example, Oficina and Bigal, I will talk about it a bit ahead, but they do have smaller connections or better connections with smaller urban gangs and micro traffickers within the cities in an, in an interwoven complex network of people, of groups, of cells that uh, end up um, doing the uh, drug dealing businesses on the, on the street level. And many of these urban gangs will actually have some sort of uh, a, a level of control within some neighborhoods in some of the cities. Uh, and Medellin is a, is a good example of this. Antioquia is a good example of this. Um, then if you go up there, you can find the invisible traffickers. Uh, this means that and this, this is an idea proposed by Inside Crime, uh, speaking about a new generation of traffickers, basically because besides the major cartels, the big Grupos Armados Organizados that you know, we will find uh, traffickers that participate in the business, that have their own enterprises, that do transport cocaine overseas, um, but they're not visible. We don't know who they are. Uh, they're better at um, camouflaging within society. Um, they're, they're, they're even better trained in terms of how to process the money and how to defend themselves uh, to, within the law, uh, educate more educated people. They're not necessarily the traditional image of the drug dealers that you have from the 1990s. Think about Narcos, think about Pablo Escobar, think about you know the big drug dealers, the big uh, kingpins of the cartels. They're nothing like this. Uh, they have adapted better to society. They live within the cities. So it's more, it's more difficult to actually find them, to actually identify them, but they are part of this whole system. And right there in the top, you will find this idea of individuals. And what I mean with individuals is you can have people in the regions. Think about, uh, for example, the demobilized members of FARC. Uh, they may face a system, they may have a choice. Uh, should I continue to be on the road of peace, you know, trying to respect the track of reincorporation to society, or if situations are difficult, should I just go back to war? So if I want to go back to war, then you have all the system. If you want to go back to conflict, you have 
all this system offering you all the possibilities of joining any of these groups. Um, so individuals are part of the system as well. In terms of, uh, they, 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 they could find a way to actually join one of these big organizations or they might come together with different people who are facing the same situation. So they decide, no, we're, we're joining, we're creating a new organization. So I join the system through a new group that I am creating with other people and then I am part of the system. And uh, if, if I'm not wrong, uh, the crisis, the COVID crisis, uh, the employment crisis, the economic crisis, pushing people towards crime. Uh, and I think that's not an exclusive dynamic of Colombia. I think in Latin America, where we have a, a big presence of different criminal groups, uh, that people will be tempted to actually join one of these groups as a way to solve the employment situation. So these are the actors of the system. But the most important thing to understand is that, as I said, this is constantly fluctuating. This is constantly changing. We ask ourselves, why violence continues? Uh, well, violence continues because this system has the ability to transform itself, to adapt according to the circumstances, according to the context, as the state uh, creates all the types of operations in order to destroy them, in order to attack them. And uh, we can go through different examples in order to understand this more clearly. Uh, think about, for example, about the puntilleros. Uh, puntilleros are one of these big group armados organizados, although they have been quite weakened uh, in the recent years. Some people discuss they don't even they don't even care anymore that they might be down to 70 members. Uh, so it's pretty much we can we should not consider them a group armado organizado, and that might be the truth. But the interesting thing about the case is to analyze the trajectory, to analyze what the group is and how it was created. Um, so puntilleros is. Um, the consequence of the demobilization of former self, uh, how do we call them, AUCs, the self, United self Defense Forces of Colombia, the paramilitary, the right wing, call them whatever you want. Um, so in, in, in some of the areas of the Eastern Plains in Colombia, in Meta, in Guaviare, uh, there used to be the Bloques en Tauros. Bloques en Tauros as one of the main blocks of the AUC, of the paramilitary groups. Uh, and they demobilized in 2006. And when they demobilized in 2006, some people refused to demobilize, pretty much like it's happening today with, uh, with FARC. And uh, members, specific members of one of the fronts of this block that was called uh, Héroes del Guaviare, uh, decided to stay in war. So, with under the leadership of one commander, alias Cuchillo, uh, they created the famous ERPAC. ERPAC was a group uh, called the Ejército Popular Revolucionario Anti-Subversivo, um, Anti-Subversive Revolutionary Popular Army. And they were operating in this region, in, in Meta and Guaviare. Uh, but years ahead, 2010, Cuchillo is killed. So the ERPAC begins to erode. It begins to destroy. So we killed one person, but that does not mean that the organization, in terms of the numbers of people, the people who are there actually disappear. They do not disband, they do not go back home. They stay in war. What did they do? Well, they created two different organizations. Uh, the Bloque Meta on one hand, and the Libertadores de Vichada in the other hand, with two different commanders. Bloque Meta was led by alias Jonathan, and then uh, Libertadores de Vichada was led by alias Pijar Bay, which is quite a funny name. I love the names of these people. Um, both of them were killed. They were killed in 2015. Uh, so you can say, okay, we kill the people, we kill the leaders, we kill the commanders. It's a fantastic strategy. We're ending up the organization. But that's not what happens. Once again, the process of adaptations brings us the possibility to have a new leader which brings together 
this uh, bunch of people that were uh, members of other organizations. Um, Mauricio Pachon, alias Puntilla, brings together the people from, from these groups and creates what we believe today uh, as Puntilleros. There's a big debate uh, if Puntilleros actually existed as a group or if, if they were two different groups, Bloque Meta, Bichada. Uh, some numbers show us that there were 135 members at some point, uh, but there's a, as I said, there's a big debate if this group is actually important. It's down to 70 members today. It might not be relevant for the system, but the point is understanding how this adapts, how it constantly adapts. Another example, and I want to go faster to this because the time is, is running out. Um, another example could be, for example, Caparrapos, uh, the smaller group Caparrapos, which uh, Inside Crime believes uh, gathers about 450 people at this point, is also an evolution of former AUC combatants. Caparrapos was a creation of uh, former paramilitary leader Makaku, and um, in 1996, Makako created this organization as a sort of private army to defend against other competing leaders of the AUC. Um, by 2006, as you know, uh, the, the AUC demobilizes um, and they uh, go back. I mean, Caparapos was a member of AUC at some point, but with the disbandment in 2006, Caparapos uh, decide to create their own organization and they enter a war against Urabeños, against the Paisas, against the Rastrojos. Uh, but then in 2009, they create an alliance with Urabeños. So they become like part of one of these umbrella groups that we see today in Colombia, which is uh, the Urabeños, uh, which is practically different fronts come together under this big umbrella. Um, in 2009, they join Urabeños, but uh, Urameños start to be hit hardly by the operations of the military forces, Agamemnon 1, Agamemnon 2. These are specific operations of the police and the military forces which target uh, the Urameños quite strongly. Um, so by 2017, uh, the Caparrapos once again decide to go out as a separate organization. And they go back in a war against Urameños. Uh, so you can see this fluctuation. So you can see because uh, the Urabeños might be weakening, uh, even though they are very strong in terms of manpower, uh, you can see the opportunity for other organizations to split out and to try do you know the, the things by themselves. Um, so it's it's once again this kind of constant evolution of the system is how the system adapts in order to perpetuate. The illicit economy is happening. And finally, we can, we can speak about uh, La Oficina de Envigado, which is one of these outsourcing companies. Oficina de Envigado is itself a network of networks. Oficina de Envigado brings together at least eight, some people say 10 different groups within the city, uh, each, each one uh, doing their own tasks in the city, micro-trafficking, charging, extortion, homicide, etc. And, and Oficina de Bigal itself is an evolution from uh, Pablo Escobar's cartel uh, and it jumps, jumps, jumps and it comes, becomes into part of this intricate system of networks. So as you can see here, and in, in order to conclude uh, under the 10 minutes I have, although I think I'm running over time, uh, the idea is to have an idea of a system, not only organizations, but a system that changes, that evolves, that offers the possibility for people to join, uh, whether creating new organizations or uh, joining existing ones. And you can see that patterns of cooperation and uh, uh, conflict are also constantly changing between them. Uh, you can see, for example, between Urabeños and ELN cooperation in some of the regions, struggle in others, so these patterns will change constantly. And also, uh, did you have a sort of continuum between the political and the criminal agendas? It's very difficult at some point in some of these cases to separate uh, these groups in terms of 
political agendas? Like, do they have a political objective? Uh, are they insurgents? Are they are they fighting for the I don't know the rights of the people for social equality, uh, or are they fighting specifically for uh, drug trade or or drug trafficking routes? Uh, you will have a combination between the two things in in many of these actors. So it ends up being a complex system of illicit flows of actors dedicated to illicit flows, but also some of them with a political uh, motivation behind it. And that's what makes it complex. So do you have in mind that we have that kind of diffusion between politics and crime, and we have that kind of diffusion uh, between patterns of cooperation and parents of uh, struggle and fight. Um, I leave it there, Antonio. I think that's pretty much the main idea. Thank you very much, Oscar. Uh, I think those those were very uh, two very uh, detailed and uh, very rich uh, presentations, full of information and points for us to discuss. Um, you, um, if you're attending this webinar, you can ask a question via the Q and A option on the bottom of the screen of the Zoom screen by typing your question, or you can raise your hand, and I will try to. Um, um, to give you a voice. So I just had, I, I have a very initial um, round of quick firing questions um, that you can um, choose which ones you prefer to answer. So first of all, what's the, the these groups that um, are occupying some of the spaces left by the bulk of the FARC, um, do they differ uh, from FARC in terms of the way that they fund themselves. So FARC used to have a very strong territorial control. And what are the illicit economies that are sustaining these armed groups that are going to, I, I presume that uh, cocaine and coke cultivation feature prominently, but um, how's the picture of illicit econ um, informal mining and other types of illicit economies? And finally, um, the issue of paramilitaries is one that um, is, occasionally resurrected in Colombia, and the term neo-paramilitary groups has been used to, uh, to describe some criminal organizations. I think I've heard this term being used for the Urabenos or Clan del Golfo, as they sometimes are called as well. So I, I, I wish, you, I, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the um, um, paramilitary phenomenon as it stands now in, in Colombia. So perhaps Maria Victoria, if you'd like to, to start. Oh yes. Um, well, you know, there is a, there is a huge uh, uh, discussion about this uh, uh, paramilitary phenomenon in Colombia, and you're right. Uh, some people call these new groups uh, neo paramilitaries because some of them, and mainly the, the Clan del Golfo, for instance, uh, has roots in the previous paramilitary groups, but uh, they they really don't operate in the same way. Uh, I think that Oscar made a, a, an important point on showing how these groups are changing, transforming, and adapting to new realities. So, so and, and part of the problem is that they are continuously uh, adapting. Uh, but uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so I wouldn't say we have a paramilitary paramilitary groups as we knew them in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we, we have a completely different landscape of uh, criminal organizations and, and they are financing, of course, in, a, in a, a criminal a, economies, there are a lot of smuggling, a, a, a drug trafficking, but also a, illegal mining. So, uh, so uh, for instance, ELN right now, it's really having access to a lot of illegal uh, resources. I will just have, I, I will just like if you, if you let me do it, uh, Antonio, I would like to, to, uh, to do some sort of a response or reaction to what the uh, Oscar, uh, uh, to the, 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 um, the presentation of Oscar, uh, if I might do it. Yeah? Yes, yes, but very quickly oh, okay. because we have a lot of questions very, already. 
Okay, so, so, so very quickly. So I would like to say that, yes, I think it's a very interesting to uh, consider and really understand that uh, the, um, the, criminal, the, the criminal system, uh, how it adapts and reproduces. But I think that that is only one part of the story, you know, on why we have been, uh, 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 it, it has been so difficult for Colombia to stabilize. The other part of the story has to do with institutional fragility, institutional capacities. Uh, it's not only a process, and, and, and I think that we are within a bigger system where we have both all these uh, interactions uh, between uh, uh, in, in the criminal world and the legal world, but also the interactions uh, regarding with political and institutional uh, conditions. So I just wanted to point out that because, because I think that this uh, criminal system doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't work in the void. It works within an institutional framework. Uh, Oscar, if you could answer quickly, uh, we have a lot of questions, um, so please go ahead. Definitely. Uh, I agree with Maria Victoria in the analysis of paramilitary groups. I, I don't believe that uh, they're, they're, they can be compared to the experience of the 90s and 80s of this group. So I believe that the name is more uh, related to uh, their, their origin. Like they, they, they began, it, they're, they're an evolution of former paramilitary groups. So we call them neo-paramilitary, but they, we cannot say they're paramilitary in the specific sense of the term. Uh, I don't think they, they operate uh, pretty much in combination with the military forces or, or in any way uh, with state cooperation. It's a, it's a totally different phenomenon. So I do not, I do not believe that we can, we can fairly compare them to, to the 90s and 80s experience. And um, on, the other, on the other point Maria Victoria raises, I absolutely agree. Uh, I should have been clear about this from the beginning. I do not mean that I do not mean to explain the whole continuation of Colum violence in Colombia through this explanation. It is just one explanation, but of course, institutional weakness, the lack of state presence in many of Colombia's areas actually allow illicit economies to flourish. And then in the absence of, of, of state institutions, then these organizations create some kind of governance and, and, and some parallel kind of institutionality. Uh, in order to, to, for these economies to preserve. And on your second question, um, on, 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 the, on the illicit economies, drugs, of course, narco-trafficking, cocaine economy is, is always a, a key factor of financing for groups in Colombia, but it is not the only one. And some people think erroneously that if we end up the coca economy, then all the problem of crime is going to be solved, and that's an illusion. It's not going to happen because there are more illicit economies, as Maria Octorio was mentioning. So as you mentioned as well, uh, illicit mining, uh, even um, trafficking of species, uh, trafficking of migrants, extortion. Uh, there's many, many sources through which uh, these groups actually find funds. Thank you. Uh, so I will try to group some questions. Um, the first one is on peace negotiations or agreements with armed groups. So what would be some of the preconditions for resuming talks with the ELN? Do you think that if the government changed its preconditions, is there any suggestion that the ELN would reciprocate and become more um, amenable to peace negotiations? There is also a question from about government uh, the government has hinted that it wants to transition some of the grupos armados organizados, perhaps some of the criminal groups, the larger criminal groups, uh, into some kind of peace agreement or negotiation. Um, do you see that as, as feasible as possible? And the other set of questions is roughly on security sector. So Maria Victoria, uh, how do you think that security sector reform could take place considering that the armed forces in Colombia have historically uh, been a bit reluctant to deep transformations um, in things like doctrine and, and their um, longstanding practices? Um, and finally, also related to the security sector, do prisons play any role in promoting or facilitating recruitment and um, 
criminal activities. Oscar, do you want to take this first? Sure. Uh, in terms of, of negotiations and peace agreements, um, well, the government, uh, the current government has pretty much set a series of conditions in order to meet with, with the ELN, to, to engage with negotiations in the ELN. Um, so I, I, I don't think, I, I don't see the government moving from that position. Uh, of course, we, would, we, we, we don't have a, a futurology kind of ball here to know what's going to happen. Uh, but the, the, since the beginning, the government has been quite uh, determinant on, on, on the preconditions in order to sit with the ELN again. Um, I don't know if this crisis, if the, if the uh, COVID crisis is going to motivate groups to actually sit in the, in the negotiation table. Uh, it has happened in some other places, but uh, I'm not really sure that the ELN is actually going to change its position or the government is going to change its position in order to sit down. I, have, I, I don't see it happening, so we, we will have to see. Maria Victoria might have a, a better idea of this, but in terms of, of other groups and other possible peace processes opening, um, several of these groups are trying to build a, a kind of political profile more than a criminal profile. We've seen it with Urabeños, Cartel, Cartel del Golfo. Uh, they have created some videos trying to present themselves as, a, as revolutionary armies and not necessarily uh, criminal groups in order to, uh, you know, knock the door and see if I can actually land into a peace negotiation with the government. Uh, I don't think it's going to be very easy if, if, if groups uh, are pretty much dedicated to criminal economies, to drug dealing or other criminal economies. I don't see it that the state will open up the doors and sit into a negotiating table. Um, Governments have talked about rendition conditions. We can we can enter into a discussion of what your uh, conditions are going to be in order for you to surrender and to give yourself up to justice, but not necessarily in terms of a political uh, negotiation peace process. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to be very easy for these groups in order to uh, build a political profile in order to sit down at the table and convince the government to actually sit down and negotiate with. Maria Victoria. Okay, so uh, I I I completely agree with Oscar. I don't I don't really see any any conditions, uh, nor from the government uh, stands, none from the ELN uh, for undertaking any. A negotiation in the near future. So the the possible window of, of opportunity of the hum, humanitarian action didn't really work in this case, and uh, and th this is simply not going to happen. And I think that uh, one of the variables that we really have to take into account is not only uh, the government and the ELN, but it is also the crisis in Venezuela because uh, our peace process with ELN, any peace process with ELN is completely connected with what happens in Venezuela and the outcome of, uh, of the Venezuelan situation. Uh, so that for that, uh, for, for that question. As for the security, I will go into the security sector reform uh, uh, question. And um, yes, it is true that, uh, that the military have been reluctant uh, to open, to have a more reluctant to have an open uh, process of uh, security sector reform. Uh, in fact, they uh, they had in the in previous years an important uh, uh, process of internal uh, thinking about uh, what were the role and. Uh, but uh, but yes so uh, so but the problem is not it's not only the military i think that there is a problem with civilian leadership uh, in this case and because civilian at the end of the day uh, if there if you have a, a civilian leadership that has like a, a clear strategy uh, on on how to reform and how this is necessary 
uh, to advance in our peace building agenda, uh, you will you will begin to uh, to move uh, uh, these reforms because there are there are a lot of conditions now, uh, at least in the public uh, in the from the public point of view, uh, that there are so many questions about uh, about uh, uh, the military and the police uh, in the past few years uh, that really people are and and the security situation in Colombia is not is not really worsening in a in a bad way but it's not uh, getting better uh, it's not getting better so there is a lot of questioning so i think that there is also like a a, a context and and political debate a, 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 and public debate that that will open a, a, the, the, the space for this uh, for this reform. Uh, and the thing is that I don't see the civilian leadership really considering the need of doing a, a, this. Uh, probably, probably it has to do also with uh, the difficulties that uh, se uh, security sector reform entails. It is very difficult. It would be um, a, a, a reform of our state <laughs> because we will have to take the police out of the Ministry of Defense. We will have to rearrange uh, the Ministry of Interior. So it, will, it would entail a lot of, uh, of changing of our institutions. And for that, you really need a lot of uh, political capacity, ca capital, and, and political will. Uh, and finally, on the prisons issue. Uh, yes, of course, we are facing a crisis, a, a, a prisons crisis right now, as many of the uh, of other uh, Latin American uh, um, countries. And, uh, and we've been having this crisis for the past 20 years. <laughs> so it is really time for us to do something about it. Uh, and this is part of the, the, when I talk about the security sector reform, I also consider that we really have to think over uh, our criminal justice system. It is, it is all connected. And, uh, and right now it is simply not operating as a sole uh, system. Thank you. So I will now um, give a voice to some of the uh, people who have raised their hands. And if you could please identify yourself and ask a question as succinctly as possible uh, so that others can also ask the question. So we, all, we will start with Vicente Echandia, please. Uh, Antonio, hi. Uh, hi. Maria Victoria and Oscar, hi. Uh, very Hi, Vicente. <laughs> I hope everything's all right. Uh, very interesting presentations, both of you. Uh, so, completely agree on the points you make, Maria Victoria, about the security sector reform. Uh, but the question is, and I completely agree, it's not only a matter of the military. The civilians have been scared. I mean, it, 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 is it... Is, is it is it is it fair is it fair to say that there's a fear in the civilians of how the military will react uh, to a to a proposal of, of a security sector reform and and to Oscar and I completely agree again with with Maria Victoria when she mentioned that the the system you present and and you acknowledge it completely uh, lacks uh, the, the the politicians and the entrepreneurs because I, I think you have. For, for the system to be complete, you have to, there were missing two, two boxes, one for politicians and one for entrepreneurs. But the question is, even though people have the analysis, I think, right, because I completely agree, there's a lot of people, why is it so difficult to, uh, to counter the situation? Th those are the two questions. Th thanks, Antonio. Very interesting seminar. Thank you. Uh, so now we go to Juan Felipe Sanchez Barrera, please. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, so my question first was for Oscar. I, I wanted to ask him, how did he came up with this complex set of relationships between 
these actors in your research. Is there a method methodology would you would like to share with us? For, that was my first question I was uh, putting. And the second one is that from your point of view, Oscar, is it possible that you are under, understanding post paramilitary dynamics as a local phenomenon that lacks of rational organization? And uh, in that sense, it, it acts in a chaotic fashion to respond to uh, incentives to control territory and illicit and illicit economies. Right. So finally, um, uh, Dudley Unkerson, you can go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah. Many, many thanks to both of you for uh, one very, very interesting uh, presentations. And uh, particularly to uh, both of you, best wishes also from Malcolm Dees, who was unable to be here. Um, mm. My question is uh, very much related to the need for intelligence, reform of the intelligence sector. How difficult do you think that this is going to be? It, it's increasingly obvious that the intelligence sector needs reform, both civilian and uh, military. Recent events have indicated that requires a cultural change, it requires an institutional change. Um, how difficult do you see this being? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, I, uh, I, I have other people who have um, raised their hands and questions, but I'm afraid that this will be the last round of, of questions. So please go ahead. Um, perhaps we can start with Maria Victoria. Yes, okay. So. Uh, Two minutes to, each. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for all your questions and thank you for being in this uh, daddy. Uh, lovely to hear from you and from Malcolm. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, I, will, I will answer the question about the fear of civilians and the one regarding intelligence reform uh, quickly. Uh, as for the fear of, the, I think that that was probably the case uh, during the negotiation of the peace agreement, uh, that it was so diffi that was a, a very difficult uh, negotiation, and uh, the government really lost all their um, political capital. So it was really difficult to engage in a, a, under those circumstances to engage in a, a security sector reform, not having really. Uh, the, the political capacity uh, to engage on that and having uh, political groups that were really, really messing up with, uh, with the military during that peace uh, uh, agreement uh, process. So, uh, so yes, that was the case. I don't think it is the case right now. Uh, I think it's more, uh, uh, right now it is, uh, I think it's really a lack of ideas, <laughs> of, of uh, fresh ideas, on how to deal with this and uh, and um, and really to uh, to design a, a reform uh, process. So and and last uh, uh, regarding the the, the intelligence um, reform. So we have we had an intelligence reform uh, a decade a decade ago, and uh, and probably the problem was that that intelligence reform. Uh, was done uh, in, in a vacuum. It wasn't done within the context of a security sector reform. Uh, and you didn't change uh, uh, the, the, the actors. And, uh, and yes, I think that, uh, that uh, intelligence reform will have to be part of the considerations of the security sector uh, reform. Uh, but we have to take into account that we already did this, uh, this reform and we will have to learn from that process. Oscar? Great. Uh, Vicente, hi. It's good to hear you, even though through the system, but it's good to hear you as well. Uh, thank you for your recommendation on the boxes on the system. I've actually been playing with this. Before this presentation, I had more boxes in. I've been uh, kind of synthesizing which ones to include, which ones not to include. Uh, but I'm doing some writing on this. So I'm currently writing a paper on this. So 
great to hear like the feedback and to have an idea of what else should I include in the system or what should I exclude in the system. Uh, in terms of why it is so difficult to end this, and I believe that goes back to the point that Maria Victoria raised at the beginning on my presentation, uh, the lack of licit economies, the lack of uh, state institutions, institutionality, in the most conflictive areas of our territory allows the perpetuation of this system. Uh, so it is difficult uh, to end the system basically because we would have to bring all the state, all the infrastructure, all the economic, uh, physics, social, political infrastructure to the regions. And that's very difficult to do. Uh, the United States couldn't do it in Afghanistan. It's trying to in Iraq. It's very costly. It's very expensive and it's very difficult to do. It takes a lot of time to do it. So that's why we will see that the reproduction of the system, it's, it's faster, it's now, uh, and it takes a lot of time to resolve this. So it's, that's why, why it's difficult. Uh, Juan Felipe is also great to hear you through the system, uh, um, but uh, I'm not sure I got the last part of your question, but I would say that I don't believe that there is an absolute absence of organizations when it comes to analyzing the post-paramilitary organizations or whatever you want to call them. I just believe that they're uh, pretty much like in every other country and, and in any other uh, situations of, of crime and, and terror even, that you have a, a, a component of flexibility and adaptability that actually explains a lot of what happens to these groups. And yes, there is there are organizations, but there are more uh, small groups, small cells, and you find this in, in many other phenomena. How did I come with this, with this research and the methodology, etc.? It's pretty much um, what I did in my PhD uh, was the analysis of, of FARC uh, from the point of view of the complex network perspective of insurgency. So if, if you read complexity, uh, com the, the complexity paradigm of sciences, it comes up with all of these analysis of how things evolve, change, adapt, how fluctuate, and that's where the idea actually come from. I did on FARC, but when I started looking at what's happening now, I discovered that it also happens in this case. Uh, so I just used it. So I just used the same framework to analyze what's happening here. Um, uh, I mean, on, on the reform of intelligence sector, I, I don't believe I, I need to add more to what Maria Victoria said. I, I agree with the, with the idea that we need to reform uh, intelligence, more specifically uh, military intelligence, because on civilian intelligence, we have gone through a process of adaptation. I don't know if you remember the old uh, state intelligence agency, DAS, uh, which was widely discredited, and it was, it was uh, end that it was finished, and they created a new intelligence agency that has actually done quite a good work. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that in terms of, of reform, we need to focus on intelligence reform uh, pretty much well. Uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Oscar. And uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, listening and for asking very uh, good questions. Um, I'm sorry to those uh, whose questions I did not uh, mention, but um, I think we got a very widespread, very good um, range of questions. I have two final messages for you. Uh, one is that this uh, webinar will be recorded, is being recorded and will be made available at our website and YouTube channels. If you, and I'm sure you will want to rewatch it again and again, and also to share with your network and, um, and, and, um, and present it to, to others. Um, and finally, uh, just uh, it might be of interest to you that on Wednesday, the 20, 27th of May, we are uh, at the ISS launching the Armed Conflict Survey Book, which includes Colombia uh, in, in its analysis, but also uh, 32 other conflicts uh, around the world. So it's, uh, it's a broad global analysis of trends in armed conflict, and you may want to look at our website to, to, to participate on the 27th of May. So thank you very much and um, I will see you next time.